What is up, everybody? Welcome into episode 10 of Chris and Company. I am Chris Castellani. Thank you very much for tuning in. We got an interview today with Brandon Walker, friend of Barstool, employee of Barstool, co-worker, friend of the program. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, Brandon is typically, Brandon's on pretty much all the time, which I appreciate. Uh, and I love the guy, you know, a little behind the curtain here. He's actually a really nice guy. Don't don't tell anybody that. I don't know if he wants you to know that. But uh, yeah, no, it should be fun. Mess with him a little bit and uh, ask him some legitimate questions. Like I said, Castellanite does a deep dive, so I think I hope he's surprised by the amount of research uh, that I've done in him. But before we get to that interview, if you're watching this on YouTube or Rumble, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, comment. Let me know who you want to see me interview next. We're really having a lot of fun with this. We got a good momentum going. And uh, in the description for this video, you will find the link to the link tree where you can find Chris and company on any platform that your heart desires. It's really an unbelievable thing. Shout out Austin Sisler, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Google Plus. Is that still a thing? I don't think that's still a thing. Uh, uh, eBay, Netflix, uh, E-Bombs World, all the stuff. Anywhere you want to find Chris and company, it's all there. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for all the support so far. And uh, am I leaving anything out? Uh, we made it to double digits. It's pretty cool. Right? Yeah. Not too bad. All right. Let's get to our interview with Brandon Walker. Chris and Company, episode 10, Brandon Walker, the top college football voice on the internet, or was it on the internet or in the world? Was that the official? It's the number one college football media person in America. In America, okay. Yeah. Which I would say in the world. the world. It, it is yeah. the world. There's, there's no big time college football personality in Sweden or Finland or Uganda. I, I think I am the guy. You're, you're probably right. If there is, we should find them. But yeah, I, I, I would agree. The top, top in the world. Uh, first question, have you accepted yet how completely pedestrian Michael Vick's college numbers are? See, here's the problem. If I went back, and I, regardless of what your age is, if I went back and said, you know, Kirk Gibson, when they won the World Series, wasn't very good with the Tigers. If I said Alan Trammell, his numbers don't really, they're not very good. You would be flabbergasted. You would be, Alan Trammell, I'll fucking fight you. You had to be there for Michael Vick, just like you had to be there for Alan Trammell and his 15 years of being very good in Detroit. Michael Vick, when he came out of nowhere, keep in mind, he got – I can't believe I'm answering this question this thoroughly. He he got Virginia Tech to the national title game when nobody had heard of Virginia Tech. Like, we knew they existed, but we looked at the national title game like, Virginia Tech's in it? Yeah, they got Michael Vick. Forget about how many – Throw, passing touchdowns he had, how many passing yards, his percentages. Michael Vick was that fucking guy, and he just looked different than everybody else, and he made dual-threat quarterbacking cool. And if he hadn't, who knows where we'd be right now. There was a time back in the 80s and 90s where a dual-threat quarterback just meant you had a guy who couldn't throw and you, you were never going to win a game. In general, I agree with everything you said. And I am willing to, when I look at, like, when I look at Vinny Testaverde's Heisman numbers, I know that, like, relative to the era, it's not going to compare to Joe Burrow. Like, I, I understand that. But yeah. even adjusting for the era, I was like, 1,500 passing yards? Number one overall pick? It was still – it was a little surprising as somebody who did not – who was not around for that era. That's all I'm saying. In, in early – in late 90s, early 2000s Big East, you won a lot of games 16 to 14. You won games 13 to 9. You You did these things. Uh, I understanding that eras change and numbers change. Michael Vick was absolutely a, you had to, we had never seen anything like this guy ever. And I, the, the fact, even in the pros, like I, I think now he's one of the most underrated things we have in sports in the last 30 years. Like he blew our fucking minds. He blew our minds. And that's to me more valuable than stats. Yeah, and in fairness, one of my early memories as a sports fan was 2002, 2000, well, 2003 he was injured, but 2002 Mike Vick just like going nuts. Like that was that was Lamar before Lamar. 
like uh, in in terms of what oh. you could do. Yeah. I mean, when Lamar became Lamar, it was because we, we say, man, this guy's the new Michael Vick. Well, yeah. when Michael Vick became Michael Vick, we didn't say, that, wow, this guy's the new blank because there hadn't been one. There there had been running quarterbacks. Steve Young was a running quarterback. But there had never been a quarterback who, when he got to the edge, was the fastest player on the field. No. And to me, that's that's always going to be special. And, and you are correct about that. As much as I'd like to, to mess around with it, you are correct. Um, but, no, re- okay, for, re- first real question. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Mississippi State grad class of 2002. Am I correct with that? Mm, it's it's a gray area uh, when I graduated because I didn't. Oh, really? You see, yeah. I, I read a newspaper article about you that said you graduated class of 02. You read a newspaper? Uh, okay, I don't know who wrote that. But uh, I, uh, I was at Mississippi State. I got a job in my hometown newspaper. Okay. Uh, the Daily Times leader in West Point, Mississippi, making eight dollars an hour as a sports editor on March first, two thousand four. Um, I got that job, and I just said, "I'm going to finish school. I'm going to work this job, and I'm going to finish school. I'll work this job." And I just, I never went to a class again, ever. Well, I mean, it, it clearly worked out for you because I want I want to take you back. We're talking it took a while, like, but yeah, it took a while. Yeah, but I'm, well, we go. Let's go all the way back now to two thousand seven when you're you're a you're a fresh faced boy as the head sports editor for the Meridian star, you know, kind of, <laughs> kind of talk me through uh, that, that time in your life here. Brent. <laughs> what? Yeah. So you, wow. Okay. I do my research. So 2004 and five, I was at my little hometown paper making no money. Um, then in 2005, I, I met my, my future wife. My, she became my fiance pretty quickly. Uh, after we got married in 06, we went, we, we left my hometown. We said, we're going to go out and try something. I went to a place called Bogalusa, Louisiana, and Bogalusa, Louisiana was the first time I had a job outside of my bubble, and I was a sports editor down there, and we're working, and after about six months, the thing about Bogalusa is maybe the worst place on earth, and it stinks. There's a paper mill in town. It smells. You never get that smell out of you. After six months, we had to get that smell. We had to get away from that smell wonderful people but the smell was awful and i got a chance to go be the sports uh, the assistant sports editor at the meridian star in meridian mississippi um which if you don't know meridian it's a terrific place to get shot uh meridian is Mer- meridian's a, a small-ish town in in united states terms but kind of a bigger town in mississippi i loved it there but i i you know i was a, i was a high school sports writer for six or seven years before i ever moved into college ranks and stuff like that is high school football in Mississippi? I take it it's a huge deal down there. It's a very big deal. Um, in, in the South in general, it's a bigger deal than everywhere else. You know, obviously there are some places that pride themselves, like Texas, very much prides themselves on their high school football. But everywhere down South, it, it takes on a life of its own. Louisiana's big time. Mississippi's big time. I think Mississippi at one point had the highest per capita NFL players produced in any other state. Like we're a very small state that produces a lot of. NFL players and NFL greats, uh, and that is a big point of pride with the high school football down there. In fairness, it was the Meridian Star article that said you graduated from Mississippi State in 02. I, so think, I, might- I, I think I think um, when they hired me, they didn't want to say I didn't graduate, so they just put it in there. Um, but whatever, that's not that big of a deal. Little did they know that somebody would fact check them 17 years later on a. That, on a- that, that, that that's fine. I got. <laughs> I'll send you my report cards. I was a, a poor student, and the second I could get out of there, I got out of there. Oh, you, you and me both with, with college, but you were you were uh, when you were there. You were a communications major, though, right? Uh yeah, I was trying to get into sports writing. Okay, that's that was going to be my next question. Was the goal always something in in sports media? The goal, uh, uh, the first couple of years in college, I dicked around, I dicked around, I dicked around. Didn't know what I wanted to be. I didn't know what I wanted to be. Um, I was at. Uh, Golden. I was at East Mississippi Community College. Uh, English t- teacher named Dr. Carolyn Evans. I, I wrote the the article was or the assignment was write a descriptive paragraph, and I wrote one. I gave it to her. She said, "Wow, you you know how to write. You need to write." And th- from that day forward, I tried to I tried to get into writing. Wow. There's always a story like that. A good, good college professor that's always around. It's like, a, that- yeah, and I, I, I had, I had previously like not attended her class like most days. I was just, I, I was, I was very lazy, a very lazy guy. I was just, I was just thinking about colleges. They don't. There's nobody there to wake you up and make you go. So I would just not go because that was fun. 
Um, and one day I just happened to be our class, wrote her a good paragraph, and she set me on life's path. And then after uh, you went Louisiana, then back to Mississippi, then did you have a job in Florida for a while? Did I hear that right? Yeah, sure did. Um, I worked as the sports editor at the uh, Northwest Florida Daily News in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, um, which is Fort Walton Beach area is it's about 40 miles east of Pensacola. It's about it's right by Destin. It's about 40 miles west of pa uh, Panama City Beach. Wonderful, beautiful place, and probably uh, in my pre barstool days, my favorite place I've ever I've ever worked. At that point, what what roughly what year was that when you moved down there? Uh, 2012 is when I uh, is when I moved down there, and 2014 is when I got out of there. At that point, how many like how big was your family at that point? Um, 2012, my third uh, at, when when we were moving to Florida from Mississippi for the first time, um, my wife was pregnant with our third, and about a month into me being in in Florida, she had our third, um, and that was um. You know, I had Tommy in 2010. I had the girl in 2008. And in 2012, I had the third kid. And in 2015, I would have the fourth. But 2012 to 14 is when I was in Florida. Was it? And I know it's circumstances have changed a ton. But in terms of, you know, somebody with a family, did the Chicago move, was it easier given the amount of traveling that you've done kind of, through, you know? The Chicago move has been the absolute most perfect thing I could have ever asked for from a family perspective. You know, we all do what we do. We work at Barstool, right? We, mm -hmm. for better or worse, we're, we're here a lot. We, we, we don't do actual labor. Like it, it beats working for a living. We don't do actually hard things, but we do a lot of it. And I'm on the road a lot. And New Jersey, while, while nice for what it was for a couple of years, me and my wife didn't really, we didn't make a lot of friends there. We didn't have like social circles. Um, you know, our kids didn't fit in exactly right. We got out here immediately within, within weeks. My daughter had a circle of friends. My, my son, ha sons had circle of friends. We had these, uh, so kind of social clubs. We, we had these couples we were running around with. Um, uh, it's just the value sets and, and the, uh, the way they live life out here in suburban Chicago is a lot closer to what my family is used to than New Jersey was. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, New, New Jersey, that, that's – New Jersey isn't – It's culture shock. It's, it's culture shock. Like, yeah. Midwestern people, Southern people have a hospitality about them, right? Southern people have um, – are we poor? Are we fat? Yeah, sure. But we're, we're nice as hell to strangers. We're nice, you know. Midwest people are very, very similar to that. You can just – you, you go sit at an IHOP at the bar in, in, in suburban Chicago. A guy's going to sit here. A guy's going to sit here. They're both going to talk to you. You go to a diner in Jersey. You can sit there for 24 fucking hours. The guy beside you ain't going to say shit. The guy over here is not going to say shit. The waitress probably ain't going to say shit. It's just it's just different. We're different in different parts of the country. You're right. I mean, I worked I worked in a gas station for two years, so I know that kind of – I mean, and you're, you're going to get you're gonna get assholes, but for the most part, I feel like the, there's a friendliness – there's a Midwest friendliness that doesn't exist in a lot of places. I avoided, I got, I don't know about lucky is the word, but when I was working in the, like the retail sector, I, I was always able to avoid the gas station. Uh, Cause that, that's, that's, I don't envy that. I'm sure you've got stories of, of just people just being assholes to you. And I know I also was able to avoid um, service or waiting, waitressing and waiting. Uh, I never would have been good at that. I did Radio Shack. I did Blockbuster. Uh, those were kind of my two shitty jobs. Um, but, but yeah, gas station, I could see where at least once or twice a day, somebody's going to make you want to hit them. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's in, for the most part, like we had a lot of regulars, so it wasn't that bad, but it was always, it was the yeah. outsiders who were pissed who were on a road trip, like with their family, were just stopping off in the middle of Lansing where it's like, dude, I just, I, I need to figure out how to use this card. It's like, it's, uh, right? it's not that yeah. difficult. You brought up Blockbuster. Every Blockbuster, every person that ever worked at Blockbuster had the one movie that was always playing during all of their yeah. shit. What was yours? Best in Show. Okay, not a bad one. Uh, Best in Show is a movie. It's one of my favorite movies, my top five favorite movies. It's a movie that I can never, ever, ever get tired of. We also had that thing, and I think there's a Seinfeld bit about it, where, where you could – you go to the wall and it would be our employees picks and uh, you know, Emily won't you watch this uh, legally blonde, whatever. And then Brandon had this and best in show and hot shots were always my two that I put up there. 
Good choices. I mean, but yeah, you could definitely, especially at that era, you could do a lot worse than Bust and Show, I feel like. Yeah, well, I mean, Christopher Guest movies to me just don't get old. Uh, they're yeah. they're so situational and, and move from scene to scene so well that, that you could pick it up whenever. You could walk into the store. My idea is you walk into the store, you see one scene, you watch that scene, then you, you're good. You can leave. Uh, you don't get really get hooked on it, but uh, Best in Show was mine. It was Stephen Shea's guest during the uh, controversial dozen where uh, Ken Jack told him to get fucked. That was his... Uh, oh, was it really? I don't the answer, remember. The answer was basketball, but uh, Stephen Chase said, I think it's best in show. How could you? I, I just can't fathom a world where those two uh, enter the same guest, but whatever. That's Stephen there, Chase's brain. There was something within the hint that kind of made me like, I can't, I think it was the late 90s that th threw him off. Maybe. Did you I like best in show? What's that? You're a movies guy. Did you like best in show? Oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. You like a mighty wind? I've never seen a mighty wind. But did he mighty do, wind. I haven't. Did Christopher Guest do Waiting for Guffman as well? Or yeah, no? Waiting for Guffman. Yeah. He had three in a row that were all the same mockumentary style. He had Waiting for Guffman, then he had uh, Best in Show, then he had uh, A Mighty Wind. And then 2006, I think he had Four Year Consideration, which was more of a straight line movie. It hmm. was okay, but those three are the big three. Waiting for Guffman, Best in Show, and then uh, A Mighty Wind. You said you said uh, Best in Show in your top five favorite movies. Just out of curiosity, what are the other four? All right, so uh, Best in Show, Hot Shots, That Thing You Do. I have six top five movies. Uh, Major League, which is my pick for best baseball movie, Creed, and Tombstone. Those are my – that's the six of my top five favorite movies. I'm glad you mentioned Creed because I get I have a buddy of mine who gets violently angry at me when I say I think Creed is the best Rocky movie. I think Creed is absolutely the best Rocky movie. Yeah. Uh, I think people who love Rocky, fine. If you want to love Rocky, fine. A lot of people that will sit here and fight you. Oh no, no, no chance! Rocky, Rocky, Rocky. Watch Rocky once when they were kids, or or maybe yeah. you've never even seen Rocky. They're just aware of the legacy and the dynasty of Rocky. And Rocky is an incredible fucking movie. But if you go back and watch Rocky one, it's a little slow. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It's slow. It's a slow movie. The Rocky Adrian romance is a little weird. Like there, there's no. a, there's there's I'll just say it, there's kind of a rapey scene in there. Yeah. Like it's just it's I don't know. Rocky's good. Rocky's great. To me, Creed is just such a good, perfect fucking movie. I love it yeah. so much. I know I love that movie, and I'm like I like the Rocky series. I don't have some like close personal attachment. Creed blew me away when I saw it. I mean, the first of all, Stallone was so yeah. robbed of the Oscar for that. He so should have you should have won everything. Should have won it in a walk. Um, yeah. Creed, here's the thing about Creed. So I grew up with the Rocky series. Mm -hmm. uh, Rocky came out a couple years before I was born, but Rocky two and Rocky three and Rocky four were all when I was a kid. Uh, Rocky four was the first one I ever saw in theaters. But so when I heard as an adult, because he had done Rocky five, which didn't do so well, he had done Rocky Balboa, which was okay. Yeah. Um, when I heard the concept, they're going to do Apollo Creed son. I'm like, okay, of all the stupid cash grabs I've ever heard in my life, this is one of them. This is stupid. Don't do this. This is awful. Didn't see it in theaters. I I I, oh, really? I, heard, I heard a little buzz. I was like, all right, well, I'll check it out on streaming. And I just remember watching it for the first time. And by the end, I'm standing in front of my couch cheering, yeah. like actively, like this, this movie has just grabbed me. And then I, I I I love it. I think it's amazing. And if people judge it, if they prejudge it like I did, I think there's people that have still held on to their preconceived notions without giving it the chance. No, I think you're right. And I I liked Creed 3 a lot, too. It wasn't as good as 1, but I liked it more than 2, and I thought it had, like, that was, I don't know if they're going to make a fourth one. I'm sure they probably will. But it seemed like a good end point, at least at the time. I, I think for that character, yeah, it does seem, the way they left it open, it seems like they're going to, they might transition to the to the daughter. Um, and if they do that, whatever. But I, I thought, Creed, I like Creed 2, and I like Creed 3. Neither are as, are as good as Creed was. I mean, Creed, I can, I can throw on right now and get goosebumps. Um, Creed two. I mean, let me tell you something. When that motherfucker is in the first fight, uh, and he's fighting Ricky Collin, and he's sitting there, and he says, "I got to prove I was, uh, I'm not a mistake." And then Sylvester Stallone says, "I love you, kid." And then he stands up, and they hit that Rocky music for the first time. Woo! I mm. yeah. That's that, what that, movies are, man. That's what movies are. People don't under like Creed was a big like momentous thing in Hollywood too, because I, Michael B. Jordan was already a star, but it yeah. was somebody at Marvel watched that movie and said, I want that guy to direct black Panther. And Ryan Coogler has gone on obviously to a ton of success yeah. or world worldwide name. Now he did a Fruitvale station before that, which was really good. Um, but uh, okay. So you did a lot of sports writing 
for a long time. When did the podcasting stuff come about? So um, after I left Florida, I went to I went back home to um, to Mississippi. I was a Mississippi State beat writer for the Commercial Dispatch in Columbus, Mississippi. Once again, making a grand total of thirty thousand dollars at the age of thirty five years old. Um, you know, wasn't getting rich, but I was doing college sports. And to pick up a little money on the side, we had a there was a guy, and uh, I, I reference him on Twitter sometimes. His name is Brian Haydad. And he was running something called Bulldog Sports Radio, which was a collection of Mississippi State sports podcasts all under one roof. And he reached out to me one day and said, hey, I got this uh, podcast idea, and I'll give you one. I'll give you five bucks a show or ten bucks a show, whatever it was. I'll give you ten bucks a show just to do a podcast. I said, all right, I'll do it. And I did it. And the first couple, I was just like, like every other media person. And then finally, I said, fuck it. I'm just going to be me. And then that's when I just started talking like I talk and I started being real. And that's when the podcasting wing kind of kind of took off. How quickly into that was it until Dave, you know, uh, you kind of crossed his radar? Oh, that was that was five years prior to Dave. That was, um, so so I did the Mississippi State podcast for about a year. It was doing OK, but then I, I had to I had to go make more money. So I, I went back into newspaper leadership and management. And I went, I went up to Martinsville, Virginia to be the man, managing editor of the Martinsville Bulletin. And I stayed there about eight months. And then I went to Cartersville, Georgia. I was the managing editor of the Cartersville, uh, the, the Cartersville Daily Tribune News. Um, did that for a little while. And finally, my, my big, big, big break before my big break was going to uh, working for SEC Country in Atlanta. SEC Country was a was a Cox Communications thing where they did SEC Country and Land of Ten. SEC Country obviously covered SEC football. Land of Ten covered Big Ten. And after a few months there, I became their director of podcasts, and I was the guy that would hire hire out podcasters and stuff like that. And 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 that's when I knew, all right, this is I'm pretty good at this. This will be the focus. I'm not going to write as much anymore, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. Do you ever miss sports writing? Yeah, I do. I miss Friday nights the most. I miss I miss going to, fr- to to high school football games. I miss standing on the sidelines. I miss watching the plays develop from there. I miss the kids. I miss the I miss the high school bands. I miss talking to coaches afterwards. I miss the rush of deadline when I would I would cover a game. I'd go to a game. I'd stand there. I'd jot down my stats. As soon as the game ended, I had to haul ass back to the newspaper. I had to write the game story. Then I had to design the page. I had to put the game story in. I had to bring in the pictures. And that you had to do all that within about an hour and a half window. And I love the rush of that. That 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 those moments taught me how to fucking work in media. Like how to really do hard work. Because previously I'd just been getting by on a little bit of writing talent. But I miss the deadline. I miss the rush of that. It's so interesting because I feel like that would be the thing that most people wouldn't miss. I feel I like think that is that it, when people get away from it, they they do they do enjoy the fact they don't have to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. But to me, that was just that was that was crunch time. That was that was competition time. That was I got into my groove that way, and and I do miss the Friday nights the most. Yeah, do you have you kind of gotten a a flavor of it? Having gone to some Chicago uh, high school games, a little bit, a little bit. I just been I, I I've gone to. I gone to some here. I went to about four or five games this year. Uh, it doesn't really, re- you know, sitting in the stands doesn't really re- replace the rush of of doing that. But I do enjoy just sitting and watching high school football. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So you were was it nineteen? You were hired here, April tenth, two thousand nineteen. Two thousand nineteen. You know, it's weird because you, I had been following Barstool before you were hired, and yet yeah. I, it feels weird. Like it feels like you've always been here, though. Like it, it doesn't feel. It didn't really feel. It wouldn't feel like Barstool today if like you weren't a part of it. And I feel like you're viewed as somebody who is as Barstool ready as anybody that's gotten hired here. Like, do you? I mean, it might sound a bit arrogant, but like, do you, do you feel that way about yourself? Like, I'm ready to. I'm ready to play ball here. Um, I don't know if I view it as that. I just view it as. If you're somebody, and I, I, I think you probably are along the same lines as me, but. If you're somebody who's outside the fence, if you're somebody who's outside of where you want to be and somebody opens the door and lets you in, then you're going to fucking attack it. You're, you're going to fucking go at it balls to the wall. I was uh, – April 10th, 2019 was three days before my 40th birthday. 
So I had for, for 18 years been just grinding, 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 making no money, missing car payments, doing what I can, doing what I, you know, stuff like that, taking peanut, taking, uh, taking bologna sandwiches to work. And once Dave called me and said, I want to hire you, I said, hire me because I'm fucking ready. And three hours after he hired me, I emailed him and said, all right, listen, here's, here's how it is. Here's what you got. You got a sports writer who's covered uh, college football. You got an SEC guy. You got this. You got that. You got this. I want a college football podcast. I can do all of it. And he said, all right, if you can do it, do it. So I so I did it, at least to my, the best of my ability, and, and it worked out. Do you feel like this job here, I mean, it's not, you know, without struggles. Do you feel as if it's easy or comes easier to you than uh, the sports writing stuff did? Um. Easier is 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 kind of it's just such a different, such a different grind and a different you know you got to be creative in this job. You also got to be very thin skinned in this job. Newspaper writing was a very, it was thankless. Also, you didn't get a lot of feedback. You didn't get a whole lot of. You would write something, it would go out into the ether, and then you'd show up the next week and write something again. Whereas this is immediate, immediate feedback, immediate. Hey, you're doing good, or hey, you fucking redneck, I want you to die. I had to get used to that. I, I had to get used to a little bit of that. And I, I had to, but but I do think um I do think the struggle that I went through prepared me. It got me ready to be ready for, for an opportunity. And that's really all Barstool is. It's a giant opportunity. It is he he doesn't give you a show, he doesn't give you uh, a personality, he doesn't give you anything, he gives you an opportunity. And it's up to you to do do with it what you choose. And and I was prepared for the opportunity. I, I always ask this question uh, to Barstool people that I interview. But was there a moment where you felt like you would settled in here, where you kind of took a step back and went, "Man, I'm a I'm a big part of this now." Um, I guess the first time. I don't know. I I I never really that first year was all a blur, but I remember signing my second contract. And the first time, what Dave, and I'm sure it was the same with you, when Dave found me, he reached out and he said, I give you, I'm going to give you a one year contract. Uh, it's this number. That's, that's the get in the, that's the get in the door price. You prove you can do something with that. We'll, we'll, we'll bump you. We'll make you go wherever you need to go. And that when I signed that second contract and I didn't wait a year. And when I signed that second contract, he 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 did it for three years because he said we we see a lot in you. We want you to be something. So when I signed that second contract six months in, I knew okay, this is where I'm going to be for a while, and this is this is the career now. You you only got one year off the bat. I only got one year. Did you get more? Rather not say, but yes. <laughs> well, obviously yeah. you did. Um, yeah. No, I I I got I got one year off the bat, and and. Um, like I said, I was six months in when when we re, we tore that deal up and wrote something else. But you moved to New Jersey right away when you got hired, though. I did. Well, um, so as soon as I got hired, I made sure I said, can you fly me to New York? I want to meet everybody. I want to see everything. They flew me uh, probably like April 25th, 2019, about two weeks in. I flew to New York. And then everybody I, everybody I talked to at Barstool was like, are you going to move here? I said, I don't know. And they were like, you shouldn't. You should – you should stay where you are and build up and build up and build up. And then I was like, if all the action that Barstool is in New York and I'm in Mississippi, how the fuck am I going to make a dent? How the fuck am I going to make a difference? So I went and I talked to Dave and I said, Dave, all your employees are telling me to say Mississippi. And Dave looks at me and says, they're all idiots. I said, well, I want to come here. He said, that's, this is where you need to be. And so I moved there uh, three months, uh, you know, two months later, because I, I don't know. It, again, it's that opportunity spectrum, or well, like you're gonna, you're gonna kind of do this, or you're gonna fucking do it. And uh, you know, moving four kids uh, to the Northeast, I in, in hindsight, kind of a crazy thing. I'm glad I didn't think about it very much um, because it, you know, it upset everything, but it it was the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm nerve wracking. I'm sure, especially, and that was was yeah, that scary. your scared? Yeah, and I'm sure that was your furthest move, right? Going, I mean, that was the it first was, time. It was my furthest. But the thing is, when you're when you're a father, and you move, you don't worry about moving yourself. 
you worry about the four lives that you're affecting with the move. You're worried about, will this girl uh, fit in this school? Will this boy fit in this? Will, will, will this, that? So I, 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 like, I have to worry for six people. And that, that, that bogs you down, but it's also, you know why you're doing it and you're doing it to try to make their lives better on the back end. And I, and that has been accomplished. You've always been out, out front, out in front with your opinions, which has always yeah. been great. Yeah. What is, what's been harder to deal with angry stoolies on Twitter or sec football fans like sports writing this out? Oh, I think they're, I, I honestly, I think they're the exact same. I, right. I just think we live in a world of, of, of passions uh, and whether, whether a person's passion is consuming all of Barstool and all of its personalities and hating this and loving that, or whether it's growing up a diehard Arkansas fan and, and that's all you want to hear about, a diehard Georgia fan, a diehard Florida fan. There's no, I don't think there's any real difference in a diehard Ohio State fan or diehard Michigan fan and a diehard Stooley. They are choosing what they let into their life. They're choosing what they they root for, what they, they consume. So I, I think they're very, very, very similar. And and that goes across. I mean, there's vociferous um, Taylor Swift fans. There's there's absolutely rabid. There's rabid fans of everything, every single medium now, and it it goes beyond just sports. You you choose what you consume. You choose what you root for, but you also choose what bothers you as well. Like it's there's there's a chance you can't just I, ignore what you don't like. Um, there 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 there's an element of that that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of music I don't like. There's a lot of shows I don't like. There's a lot of movies and movie styles. I've never watched a horror movie. I, you know, cause I know I don't like them. So I don't mm -hmm. watch them and I don't pass judgment on them. And I don't, I don't cast aspersions up upon them. I, I just, I think avoiding what you don't like is, is the cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think at, at the end of the day, the people who hate online are actually appreciators and actually like, what they're hating on. They want to be in that universe with them. They just choose hate as the, as the mode of transportation. They get that out there. Yeah. Hate's hates like the baseline of it. That's because cool. I think hate is most, most likely to get attention to. I mean, uh, yeah. Hate gets responses and I'm, yeah. I'm the, I'm the world's worst at that. I will, I will, I'll get a hate filled DM and I'll tweet it out. Like, look at this dude. I'll, I'll get a love filled DM and you never hear about it. No, I get, I get tweets of people saying like, why don't you ever tweet out the good things people say, say to you? I'm like, oh, that's a good I mean, point. Like, they do land and I do like them and they do yeah. matter to me, but you're not going to be interested if I put that out there. But if I put out there that somebody tweeted me that I should die and he wants to skin my family alive, like you're going to, you're going to react to that viscerally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that's why I do it. it. It is a unique thing how different people react to stuff. Cause you're right. Like if I hear a song in the radio that I don't like, I just turn it down. Right. Or change yeah. the station. Change, change station. Yeah. There's people who will like turn it up listen to it like five times in a row yeah. and then write like a thesis about how shitty that song is. Call the know? radio station and tell them, tell them they played a shitty song. Right. Like, I, yeah. All right. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. You know, I, with, I, 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 this is a question I've wanted to ask people who are so you know knowledgeable on this topic, because there's so much talk about what's going on in college football with, you know, NIL basically being this wild, wild west format and you know, the conference expansion. Are you, are you worried so to speak, about the future of college football right now? Yeah, tremendously, actually. Um, something about it is just is, is not resonating with me as, as much as it did five or ten years ago. I don't know if we're losing the soul of the sport. I hope we're not. Uh, I hope I'm just being an old man reacting to it. But the problem is there's no actual leadership in college football. I don't think any of the changes are by themselves bad. Uh, name, image, and likeness – means players are getting compensated uh, above board for the first time ever. That's good. That's a good thing. Transfer portal means there's more freedom for players to move about and find the right opportunity. That's good. That's fantastic. Um, conference um, realignment, I guess, is going to lead to more money in a lot of pockets. The problem is you've had about 15 years worth of changes in all of those uh, in all those aspects in about 18 months. And college football has dramatically changed its – it's outward complexion, it's inward. Everything about college football has changed, and it's done so this fast. And it's hard to adjust. It's hard to know what – NIL I can get over because I do think players getting paid is the right thing to do, even though they were always getting paid. They're just just by dirty programs. Um, right. <laughs> uh, Transfer portal I think is a great thing. Yeah. 
the one that bothers me the most is conference realignment. I don't have any desire to watch UCLA play Indiana. I don't have any desire to watch USC play Rutgers. I don't have any desire to get rid of the Pac-12. The Pac-12 should exist. And 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 I know we're heading towards you know, streamlined and everybody's going to make more money and it's going to be a tighter, more compact. And I know the Power Five is going to break off, but God damn it, I want to watch Pac-12 football at 9 o'clock on Saturday night. And I think some of these changes are just driving people away. And I say that, I say that TV ratings have never been higher. Revenues have never been higher. So maybe I should just shut the fuck up. Well, it's, it's a mixed bag because you can acknowledge how much this is going to help the business side of things while also saying that you're just not as big a fan of the product. Like that's kind of how, how I feel about it, where it's like, I still love college football, but you're not old man yelling at a cloud because I, what I don't want college football to become is what college basketball is now, where I just feel, I just feel completely out of like, out of sorts with college basketball has very few stars portals, you know, changing everything, which again, I'm fine with, but it's the lack of regulations that like kind of concern me right now. Yeah. They, they, they made all these changes and, and they, they set forth no regulations or no, no structure. And then they're surprised when uh, college coaches are leaving to go be a, assistant coaches in the NFL. They're surprised when Chip Kelly gives up a head coaching job to go be an assistant coach. You know why? Cause Chip Kelly was probably tired of the fucking bullshit yeah. and somebody needs to clean up the bullshit. Yeah, and I think ultimately that will happen. Like, I think it's just so dumb when somebody says a certain sport or a certain thing is dead. Like, there's evolution, there's changes. There will be, there's going to be a few rough years here with college football where well, it's going to. That's the thing. It's not dead. It's not dying. It is thriving. It is, uh, it's just changing. And sometimes you just need to step back and, and, I guess let things change, but it's hard. It's changing at such a rapid pace. I, I can't even explain to you some of the things that are happening. So I don't know. And we'll probably look back in five years and think, well, that was over dramatic. Everything's fine, but whatever. I just, uh, I, I'm going to miss the pack 12. That's, that's my statement to you. Well, I mean, it's just, I liked how regional college football was. I that's liked what set it apart from the NFL. The yes. NFL doesn't, it doesn't matter that the Seahawks are on the West Coast and the Bills are on the East Coast. They could play. They could play Monday night. You know, it doesn't. There's no. There's nothing special about the Seahawks playing the Bills. But there is something special about waking up um, in the Southeast at 11 a.m. watching Auburn play Georgia or watching you know Kentucky play Arkansas, and then knowing that this matters so much to them. Then you move. You move a little bit west, and all of a sudden you've got Iowa State, and Kansas State playing a fucking war. And then you move out west, and you've got, um, you know, you got Stanford and Cal playing a fucking war. That's not going to exist anymore. Right. So, the regionality of college football is what they're getting away from. It's also the heartbeat and the lifeblood of the fucking sport. So, how they're going to figure that out, I'll never know. No, I, I'm with you because, like, I love the fact that hey, you, you know, you have your little bubble in your conference. You win your conference, and your reward is you get to play a team that you probably would never see under any other circumstances. Yeah. Like Michigan. Wouldn't uh, you know? I know they played them uh, in the regular season a few years ago, but in general, Michigan would never play a team like Washington. Now they're going to play them every year, like yeah, and, yeah. And, play them in the national championship. That's why, and and I, I'm not an old man yells at clouds as far as bowls go, but that's why bowls were special and, and were able to, mm -hmm. even though they don't mean anything, they're just exhibitions. That's why they matter for so long. Is you would get to the end of the season if you won ten games, you'd have a chance to go to the Cotton Bowl and play. If you're Alabama, you could go play USC, and my God, that's that's a huge deal now. Now the regionality is gone. Alabama and USC probably play five times in the next 10 years. So who gives a yeah. shit? Yeah, I know. It's like the, a Michigan US, USC Rose Bowl was like the, the rarity of rarities. Now it's just, you know, it's going to yeah. be happening every season. Uh, I want to get back to some college football stuff in a second, but I want to ask you about mostly sports because, you know, uh, you and you and Mark Titus, I it seems like you guys have known each other for, for forever. Like you have yeah. a, a great chemistry with each other, and yet he has not worked here that long. When did you realize with him that like there was there was a spark there like in terms of just chemistry between you and him? So I think he started uh, about a year ago, right right around yeah. March. So March Madness last year, we were all in Columbus, Ohio, I think. Mm -hmm. And and if you remember this, this was not a good time for me. That, that I had a sponsor. I, have, faux pas. I didn't want to bring it up. Yeah, I had a sponsor faux pas about two hours into the first stream on Thursday, and that kind of affected the rest of my weekend per se. But uh, during that, you know, we had two rows of, or we had the front row where people sit on the couch, they sweat out bets, and we had the back row. And I, after the sponsor faux pas, I found myself on the back row pretty much the whole time. And me and Titus just started talking and kicking it and just, you know, 
talking and 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 he'll he's active in the the gambling barstool stuff uh with college basketball but he really isn't all that active uh as far as just just he just wanted to watch uh, uh, let me say it like this he just wanted to watch college basketball yeah. gambling or not he wanted to watch college basketball and that's where i was at the time we just started joking back and forth and um, at some point, the subject came up. Mark Titus wanted to show outside of his college basketball world. And I think PFT or Big Cat was the first one to tell him, hey, maybe Brandon Walker's the guy you're looking for. And um, yeah, we got along. We started, we tested it in September. And after the first two test episodes, we were like, yep, this is this is funny. Yeah. This is good. We fit. Um, and I think we have some good on screen chemistry. We both just like to talk ball. We also like to talk cartoons or music or titties whatever comes up we'll talk about it yeah that, that, that's how you spent most of today's show for the people who are listening yeah it was today was a, a big titty show it, yeah, that, and, that'd, and be a good, one. that'd be a good alternate title to mostly sports the big titty show would be uh, you know what the, the subtitle would get more views than the actual title would but uh yeah we've had a good time i i really yeah. enjoy it i think it has potential no no it's got more than potential man i think you guys are great i think i, I think your guys are hilarious together you would be like you strike me as two guys that would probably you have similar brains in the sense where there was a moment where I'm like, God, these guys would be good on a dozen team together. But I feel like you're almost too similar with the with your thought processes about. Them. Yeah, yeah, I, I would see where there'd be a little bit of a clash there. Um, I, I the dozen is a universe that I I often fasten. Um, I often think about other teams I would be on or other teammates, but I'm on the uh, you know I'm on the the flagship team, the the, the first team, so I'm kind of locked in. For sure. Oh, I got to ask too, man, where, where did, I don't know if you discovered him, but where did Connor Griffin come from? So back in New York, I get, I don't know when Connor Griffin's intern class was, but you know, every year we get a class of interns, right? Um, in New York, they usually show up around June. There's about 10, uh, 10 guys, maybe about five or six girls or maybe 10 and 10. I don't know. Um, but every now and then you'll, you'll, the first week they only talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Then the second week, they start, you know, a couple of them will talk here or there. They'll get drafted, and one by one, they'll start ingratiating into other shows. Connor started doing social for the Yak, and then I discovered one day just talking to him, and he has the best broadcaster voice yes. in the world. He has this amazing voice, and he wasn't doing anything on camera. I was like, we got to get that voice on camera, man. This is unbelievable. And it took a while, but finally, when we were building the roster for Mostly Sports, I said, Mark, because Mark hadn't worked with Mark was still living in LA. He hadn't worked in the office. He had visited a couple of times. I said, Mark, I got three guys. I got TJ, who's going to be the producer. Yep. And then I got Ebo, who knows every sport, everything. And then I got this guy, Connor Griffin, who needs he's got something. I don't know exactly what he's got, but he's got something. And that's that's what he's got. He is the white Stephen Shea. I do. I, I love him. I want to have him on the show. It, man, the Penn State people at Barstool like pretty high hit rate it seems whether kind of a, a mini dynasty there yeah yeah whether it's socials or you got jeff and now you got you got him killing it yeah i know no i oh. like him uh I, I like him a lot man he's a talented guy um yeah. you know i i gotta i gotta ask because this was the first thing that i got on on social media when i said that i was gonna have you on the show it's doing some light reading before we started here i don't know if you you remember but uh so uh the question everybody wants me to ask wh wh why do you hate michigan man I don't hate Michigan. I don't hate Michigan at all. I don't hate anybody. See, that's the thing about when you do what I do. Maybe you get in a thing. Maybe you pick a team to uh, to lose a game, to, to, to not win a championship. And then as soon as – like Oklahoma fans think I hate them. Florida fans right. think I hate them. South Carolina fans think I hate them. Clemson fans think I hate them. Um, Michigan fans think I hate them. They also had a run to a national title. So they were relevant every single week. And I'm talking about them every single week. And – I do, I, you know, there's certain things I can't say because of blood oaths. Um, so I won't talk about any of the circumstances surrounding that national title. I'm a man of my word. Um, however, Michigan fans want their cake and they want to eat it too, okay? Because they want to win a national title, which is what they did, but then they want you to suck their dick all along the way. And I'm not going to cave into the fact that J.J. McCarthy was a solid, 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 I mean a very solid college quarterback. At no point was he a top five quarterback in the country. At no point was he a guy that was going to go out there. You, I don't know what you're looking at in the sky. I'm, trying, he, to, I'm trying to it's think. Not written up there. It's not written up there. At no point was he a top five guy. The guy averaged about 120 yards passing a game. Um, was he asked to do anything? No. And there's kind of a reason for that. Them running the football behind that offensive line was the best way to win games. 
I have eyes. I saw the game against Alabama where he throws a pick on his very first pass and the guy just happened to step out of bounds. Like, the life with J.J. McCarthy ended up with a national title. That's all that matters. But I'm not going to pretend he was Joe Montana for you guys. I'm just not going to do it. I'll get to J.J. in a second because I am one of the – I'm a big J.J. defender. Not, not to a point where I, I'm going to declare him a generational prospect, but I am – I think in terms of Michigan, what made – what it was about this year, and I'm not – Leaving out the, the extracurricular stuff, we knew this was our like had to be this. It had to be this year, and there was some fear there because it's like if we if it doesn't happen this year, like who knows where Harbaugh is going to go. We knew it had to be this team, uh, and I think I was confident they were the best team in the Big Ten, pretty much all season. Uh, I I did not get the you you pulled the Penn State take out. I I did not, and especially with the way they played against us, that was one ah. I don't know. But uh, besides that, no, I think there was a little bit of fear. And of course, like Michigan for the longest time, for 17 years, was the team that couldn't get over the hump. Mm -hmm. And while we continually said as a fan base, it'll happen, it'll happen, it'll happen. And then it finally happened. It's like, we're going to make sure you don't hear the end of it. That's fine. I mean, uh, in, in life, to the victor go the spoils, right? Uh, all that really matters in college football is winning a national title. Michigan yeah. has won it. They get to say whatever they want to say. They get to say it to the end of time. Now, this year, when they go nine and three, and when and when everything falls apart, I'm going to be there to pick up the pieces. I mean, it always there's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, did it did it also affect me that the owner of the company happened to be a Michigan guy who pretends to be to know a lot about the football program and who's just a dick rider who jumped on the train when they got good? Um, yeah, that affected me a little bit, but whatever. Yeah, I mean, I th <laughs> there's a a lot to dissect there. I've made peace with the fact that like they will prob at least in a long, it'll be a long time before they're ever this good again. Like I've seen the one I've seen, I've seen the team that I wanted to see in my lifetime. This, yeah. this was the squad. I mean, like I, they, they pummeled their, their Can rivals. I say something else uh, about JJ McCarthy and it's not about JJ McCarthy. It's about what you just said. When a quarterback wins a national title, there's this uh, urge to say, Oh my God, what a quarterback, what an incredible, that team was so goddamn good. That team from, from Ruder to Tudor from beginning to end, whether it's the running back situation, whether it's the offensive line, whether it's the tight ends, the defensive line, you can't run on them. The linebackers, you can't run on them. They cover everything. The defensive backs gave up nothing. That team was so fucking good. All you needed to win a national title was a solid quarterback. That is what they had. And I think he was a top 15 quarterback in college football last year. That's what I believe. That's what Michigan had. And I don't understand why that answer is not good enough. Why do you have to say he's the greatest of all time? Why do you have to say he's the greatest Michigan? Why, why do you have to say he's going to be the number one pick? No, just accept that he was exactly the right quarterback for the right team. And that team was so goddamn good. Yeah. To me, the legacy of that team will be the defense. I mean, really, they, they muffed a punt against. To me, to me, Chris, it's the physicality. It's the, yeah. that team would wreck you. On yes. both sides of the ball, that team would physically because we have seen, we've seen, we've seen non-SEC teams get on the field with SEC teams in the playoff, and the SEC team athletically and physically just dominates them immediately. Whether yeah. it be Notre Dame, whether it be Michigan a few years ago against Georgia, whether it be anybody, Ohio State's had it happen to them, Oklahoma's had it happen to them, where they get on the field with an elite SEC team and the the athleticism, physicality, immediately it's over. Mm -hmm. Michigan, Michigan gets on there, and body wise, physicality wise, speed wise, athleticism wise, they were every bit as good and better than Alabama, and that's the first time we've seen it in a long time. Yeah, I mean Washington's offensive line won the Joe Moore Award, and Michael Penix was on his ass that entire game. The I entire mean, they, game. The yeah, entire they game. Gave up, they gave up three touchdowns in two playoff games against those offenses. No, that was Michael Penix yeah. looked like he had never. Michael Penix looked like he had never played high level quarterback. He looked like he was just guessing. He looked yeah. like he was. Jalen Milrow looked like, and he really can't throw very well, but he can run. Uh, he looks terrified. He looked terrified the whole time. The Alabama center wasn't snapping it low because he's just a terrible person and, and doesn't know how to snap. He was snapping it low because he was he was about to get his fucking head knocked off every time he was snapping the ball. Yeah, and you, I agree. And I think we're gonna look back in that defense. Not, not to this extent, but kind of like when we look back at LSU's offense in 19, and we're like, Jesus, all these guys were on the same group together. Like, I think we're going to kind of feel that way about Michigan's defense. In terms of JJ, here's where I'll defend him. Because having been a Michigan fan for 20-plus years now, I've been born, every Michigan quarterback is hyped up to be the greatest thing ever. That's and fine. every one of them has disappointed to some extent. 
JJ is the only one that we've had where I legit one that I felt like was a legitimate NFL talent. And two, I felt like added something to their offense that was there were plays that were added to the playbook because JJ McCarthy was their quarterback. And I I'm w i am I do not think that they win the national championship if say Kane McNamara or Wilton Spate or one of the other Harbaugh quarterbacks is there. Like I think they you know, he was the best player on the field in the Rose Bowl. I mean, I I have a hard time giving to somebody who wasn't on the Michigan defense, but Sure. And, the, and I'll, tell you this, I'll tell you this, for much of that game, he was not the best player on the field. But from about the five-minute mark of the third quarter into the end of the game and overtime, yeah, yeah, you could make that claim. So, so, I'll, And that's when it matters the most. Yeah, and, and I mean, like, I, I know we overrate. He was awful in the first half of the Rose Bowl. He was awful. He threw two touchdowns in the first half of the Rose Bowl. He threw an interception on his first pass. The guy just happened to step out of the and that's that's the other thing about he's the, there was a notion not saying that you've uh, you've uh, said this but there was a notion that he's like erratic he turned the ball over three times four times last year and three of them were in one game like he's a he's a very accurate like pretty consistent quarterback I mean I don't a lot of it depends on what system he's going to get drafted into I'm not going to say he's going to be you know uh, Mahomes yeah. but uh, but I, I'm I've been a big JJ guy and ultimately like I know we overrate sometimes can overrate QB stats or QB wins because. You know, if you've got a good team around you, like, you know, a lot yeah. of guys win. Going back to high school, dude, he's 61 and three as a starter. Like, that's got to be worth, that's got to be worth something, man. It's a good quarterback. Very solid quarterback. I've never said he's not a good quarterback. I've just said I would take four, five, six, seven, eight guys in college before I would take him. And having been around Michigan fans my entire life, I know the exact, like, I know exactly what you're talking about, where you are saying, you're giving him compliments. You're giving him praise. Like I'm the guys saying, I'm saying uh, incredibly solid quarterback. Top 15 yeah. quarterback in the country. What they want is for me to say, my God, best quarterback of all time. And I'm yeah. not going to do it. They want me to say he's the best quarterback in the country. And I'm not going to do it. And 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 that is not exclusive to Michigan. Oklahoma fans want you to tell them that Dylan Gabriel last year was the best quarterback in the country. South Carolina fans want you to tell them that Spencer Rattler is the best quarterback in the country. Florida State fans want you to tell them that they if Jordan Travis doesn't get hurt, they would win the national title in a walk. They, they So every fan base does it. Michigan just happens to be the crown holders right now. Can we yeah. just talk about anything but Michigan football? I think I the last point. I think there's a certain amount of gatekeeping with JJ because I, I am somebody who buys into the fact that I think his numbers are not a reflection of how good he actually is. For one, he played like 60% of snaps. I mean, they were blowing teams out throughout the yeah. entire season. He wasn't able to stat pad a lot. And I think in that kind of run first scheme, you're going to look at the numbers and say, hey, it was okay. When in yeah. reality, I think that he added a lot more to that, to that team than people are. I would just, I would counter with um, how many legitimate top five picks in college played in a run first scheme. If you have a top five pick, if you have a guy who's going to be a franchise quarterback, you might adjust the scheme a little bit to where it's based on him. And I don't think he's, I don't think he's a franchise quarterback. I think he's a guy who's going to get a couple of years as a look and then he'll be a backup. I think he's really a second or third round pick that might get picked in the first. To me, I think he's this year's Will Levis. Yeah. Last year, Will Levis, everybody at this point was saying, this guy might go number one. This guy's top five. And then on draft day, all the teams were like, actually, actually, we might take a flyer on him in the second round, which is not a bad thing. That, you know, if he gets, if JJ McCarthy gets drafted late first round or early second round, that's still pretty goddamn good. But mm -hmm. I don't think he's a franchise NFL quarterback. And if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll live with it the rest of my life. I guess I'll somehow manage. I actually think it would be better for him if he dropped mid late first round i think he'd be put he put himself in a better situation there than as opposed to a team that's rebuilding. yeah you don't want to be like a trubisky situation where you're the number you're the three pick right and you don't really belong as a number three pick yeah no i'm with you like i saw i saw a projection that had him potentially the seahawks i'm like i think that'd be a great situation for him with uh mike mcdonald was the uh d coordinator in michigan a few years ago uh brandon i could talk to you all day man but i know you got uh you're you're ever busy you got an episode of the yak to record thanks for doing this buddy yeah, no, I, I enjoyed it. I, I like this. Uh, I like the idea of just having a no nonsense conversation because I feel like our jobs are based on a lot of nonsense. Uh, <laughs> so anytime you can just just throw that to the side and just talk, that's that's fun. I, I appreciate it, man. Hope to see you in person soon, buddy. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. All right. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. of course. Thank you very much to Brandon. Always a fun time uh, when he joins us. Like I said, he's a, he's always a good sport about this stuff. Immediately, I got a million Michigan people being like, you got to go after Brandon. Like, what do you want me to do? I'm going to crucify the guy. He did me a favor. He's doing my show. He's a good act. All right. That will do it for this 
episode, we will be back next week, Tuesday, an interview. Max Clark, Tigers' first round pick in last year's draft, number three overall pick, current top prospect. It, it, doing this show, I, I noticed this with the Jackson Job interview too. I, like, I'm old enough now where there's like a generation below me. Where did the time go? Okay, anyway. Like, subscribe if you're on Rumble, if you're on YouTube. In the description for this video, you'll find the link tree. Everything, everything is there. Like I said, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Rumble. Uh, I'm trying to think of random web, Vimeo. Uh, oh, hey, there's a little thumbs up. Oh, hey there, hey there. I don't know how that happens. That happens every so often if you're watching on YouTube right now. Okay, enough. Uh, ADD Radio here today. Thank you guys so much. Um, we're, we're 10 episodes in now. I, I mean this sincerely. I have enjoyed doing this more than anything that I've done really at Barstool. I, I I love doing this show, and I hope that in turn, you all have loved listening to it as well. Shout out to Austin behind the sticks, putting all the fixings on it. He's killing it. We will be back here next week. Thank you guys for all the support. Have a good one. Peace and happiness. I'm just a devil with no